Thank you, Shelley. It's a delight to be here. Uh, you know, I've been coming out to uh, Esri for a while, and I was thinking about that as I was parking, because I saw one of the old buildings. I think it was 1990 when I first came out to try and ply some free software uh, out of Mike Phoenix, who was then the educational director, and he gave me those licenses, and it's been a great ride ever since. And I really appreciate Town and Gown for uh, hosting me and Esri and uh, obviously the school. What I'd like to do is talk to you uh, this evening, early evening, I guess, uh, about uh, what I'm up to, uh, what we're up to at the school, uh, where we think we're going, uh, what that means for business education, how it all gets solved by GIS, and, and so on, and, and so forth. Uh, so let me first make sure I run this thing the right way. There I am. Oh, and happy GIS Day. I, it's a great coincidence to be here on GIS Day. So, uh, the School of Business. Uh, do we have University of Redlands School of Business? Well, how many Redlands graduates do we have here? That's a great showing. And how many of those are School of Business graduates? Okay, all right. Well, I'm, I hopefully will honor your school uh, well uh, tonight and in general. Uh, now, when I came uh, to Redlands, I had known about it at the University of Redlands because a colleague of mine, uh, Jim Pick, and some others, we had worked together, and I knew things about the school, but I didn't know as much about it as when I joined. And people would come up to me and say, did you know that we had, we had 1,700 students? And I'd go, really? Uh, did, do you know that we had 28,000 alumni? And I'd go, really? So I kind of half-jokingly call this my really sheet. It's like a cheat sheet on all the things the School of Business really is. And uh, they will be left outside. If you want a memento, uh, you can have one. But I thought, uh, particularly for those who are not familiar with the School of Business at the Univ Univ University of Redlands, to just go over a few things. Uh, it really is, see, really, uh, a Southern California business school. While our heart is in Redlands, we have seven campuses, San Diego, Temecula, Orange County. They're all listed here. I usually leave one out by mistake. Riverside, uh, San Diego, I said that, uh, Burbank. So across these seven campuses are 1,700 students. 30% of those students go to school at Redlands, which is great. 70% go to these regional campuses. That's what really makes us really a, uh, a Southern California school. We're not only a Southern California school, but we're really a school about empowering opportunity and impact. And I did not fully appreciate the impact that the school was having on students, such as our alums here. Uh, some 38% were promoted while they're in the program. 78% expected to be promoted within five years. That's real optimism uh, coming out of the education that they're receiving. I didn't fully appreciate how diverse the student body is, with 26% uh, Hispanic, 18% Asian, 15% Afri African American, that's in 30% uh, uh, Caucasian. That's in our most recent class, with 28% with being veterans. A full 51% of our starting class this year are first generation, which is a real accomplishment for them to be in our school and a real opportunity for our school to give, uh, to give uh, you know, an education that can work for the life of people who are here getting their education as a first generation student. So for me, uh, this is an, an incredibly uh, diverse set of students spread throughout Southern California that are looking to business education and looking to our school to make a difference in their lives and, and make a difference in their careers. And we take that very seriously. The good news, um, there's many pieces of good news. One of them is when we surveyed students, 25% uh, of our graduating graduate students made over $100,000. That's quite something. I mean, it's quite an economic accomplishment. Not the only reason we're doing it, but it's always a good thing to be able to move up the economic ladder. So these are uh, two of the, I think, really defining attributes of the school. A third is this notion of pathways par and partnerships. The University of Redlands has, and the School of Business has over 400 organizational partnerships. It's a stunning number of organizational partnerships. Now, they're all not equal. Uh, they're all good, 
but we have really some top tier partnerships that are very important to us. And one of those top tier partners is, partners is definitely ESRI, a long standing partnership with ESRI students. I think we've graduated over 300 students uh, from ESRI who have worked through ESRI. So it's been a real pipeline uh, for ESRI and a real opportunity for us. We've started some new partnerships we're, that we're very proud of. One of them with UTC, United Technologies Corporation. Uh, you probably, you may not have heard of it, but they bought up a lot of aerospace companies and now have 100,000 employees. And we're a preferred provider for them, and that's a tremendous opportunity. We have a new relationship with the county of Riverside. We have a new relationship with San Manuel Tribe. So we are really accelerating how we work with businesses and organizations to deliver education. You know, a lot has been written about student loan and the student loan crisis, and it is. One aspect that hasn't been highlighted is how businesses like ESRI, like UTC, are really stepping up to the plate to help employees finish their degree, get a master's degree, and that is critically important to us. We recently launched an online MBA, and that's going to allow us to not only have a footprint in Southern California, but throughout the country as we roll out these partnerships. A fourth fundamental element of the school is its focus on ethical leadership. We have a Banta Center of Ethics in Society. Uh, ethics is a required course in our programs. Uh, we're developing a, a program in purposeful leadership and ethical leadership. So it's a core component of our education, a core component of our values, uh, being ethics and how, how to incorporate ethics into business decisions and organizational decisions. And then fifth, but not la last but not least, is uh, the school and the university is, we are a spatial school within a spatial university. We have a GIS requirement for our undergraduate business majors, which means that we've probably touched more business majors with GIS, certainly than any other graduate school in Southern California, and probably beyond that. We have a GIS emphasis in our MBA. There's less than a half dozen schools that have that throughout the country, and we were a pioneer and will continue to be a pioneer in that regard. We have GIS centers and labs, uh, both in our school, as well as through uh, spatial studies, which Steve Moore uh, directs, and other labs. So we really are a mosaic of spatial interests uh, at, at the University of Redlands. And that is a cornerstone for us now and a cornerstone for us moving forward. Now, when I came over, when I saw the light and moved east, uh, uh, I did take a quote with me <laughs> from the Drucker School. I'm allowed one quote. And uh, because Peter Drucker r really defined the terms as management as a liberal art. Now, when you think about Redlands, it's a liberal arts school. So one would ask, how does this translate? And when he defined it in 2003, he said, management is, is what tradition used to call a liberal art. Liberal, now, that's not like liberal, like conservative, right? It, liberal because it deals with the fundamentals of knowledge, self-knowledge, wisdom, and leadership. Art, because it deals with practice and application. Managers draw upon the knowledge and insights of the humanities, in social sciences, on psychology and philosophy, on economics and history, on the physical science and ethics. But they have to focus this knowledge on effectiveness and results. So it's this combination of a broad understanding, but targeted application in ways that can make a difference to organizations and to businesses. That is what's meant as management by, as a liberal art. And there are, uh, there are colleges here, I mean, at Redlands, I spent a sabbatical at actually uh, in Hong Kong working with a college to develop a management as a liberal arts focus. So, so there really is a whole spectrum of colleges that are interested in it, and that was a real attractor for me to come to the University of Redlands was to, it was to be able to think about management as a liberal arts, business as a liberal art, and then how do you translate something that into something that's pra of practical value? So we've been working on this within the context of our strategic plan. And you know, I've been a part of strategic plans that go on and on, and it just drives me crazy. So we've really focused it within six months to race through a strategic plan, identify our strengths, our priorities, and so on. And we have these things called learning outcomes 
that the accreditors like to uh, ask us about, and those are important. But what we started to think about was, what are the critical skills that we want our students to have? And by skills, they can be conceptual skills, you know, te technical skills, but how do we organize these skills? And we started to do some reading on 21st century business skills, and there's various lists around that one can think about, and we did. We kind of swirled it all around, <laughs> and, and we're just starting to refine it. So we've narrowed it down to 10, uh, and I'd like to talk to you about those 10, but I'm going to do it in an audience participation way, <laughs> which may fail. Uh, so uh, we'll give it, it's the first time out here, so, uh, uh, so I should have had plants in the audience. Uh, so I want to see, this is kind of a combination of, you know, on NPR, uh, wait, wait, don't tell me, and, the pu and, 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 you know, the word, what's the puzzle one, right? Uh, so, uh, so let's see how it goes. Some say I can sound like the wait, wait, don't tell me guy if I uh, get between my voice a little bit. Uh, so now, when this was done on an Apple, you could see the first initial of each of the 10. Uh, this is why I don't like PCs. <laughs> you can't. So I'm going to help lead you through it. There's 10 here. Uh, all that any student here is required to offer an answer, uh, and I will help cheat the rest of you through. Uh, so, so the first critical skill, what do you think the first critical skill in, in the 21st century? Honestly, some of them are 20th century too. Huh? And it begins with I. Integrity is important. I'm going to get to that one later. Let's put it this way. You can know a lot of things, but what do you have to do to be able to pull it together? Right? Insight. Integration. There you go. Right? Integration, inter integrative skills to take intuition, knowledge, insight, creativity, integrity. How do you integrate that into a point of view, a position, a product? That is a pre, you know, preordinate skill. Some of these other ones kind of fall around th those skills. For example, the second one begins with A. And I'll give you a hint. You have to have this skill, I believe, to work at ESRI. All right. Analytical, right, all right. Free, free, free roses up in the corner there, okay. Analytical, okay. D, hint. ESRI is not a pen and paper operation. Digital, how can you be in the 21st century without digital, right? Okay, S. Hey, there we go. <laughs> what do you teach? <laughs> spatial, now one may say not every list has spatial as a critical skill. This is our list at Redlands in the School of Business. So for us, as a spatial school, it is a critical skill. And later, I'll talk about if 80% of business data is locational data, how can you not have a, a, you know, a, a spatial capacity? Okay, the next one starts with G. It relates to spatial because the world is not flat. <laughs> global, yay, right? A global perspective is needed. Uh, and how many of you, how many of you have traveled outside of the United States, for example? Look at that, right? And I'm sure if we were to ask that question 50 years ago, it would have been very different. A global pers uh, uh, perspective is essential. Okay, now this one, I want to warn you, there are two E's, all right? So what is the biggest E, this is debatable, the biggest E in a business? Ethics, that's right. Ethical behavior is fundamental, and it's a core value, and we make it a requirement in our program. Oh no, I cheated! <laughs> this, I'm gonna guess that this one is collaborative. Uh, and so the ability to work in teams is a critical skill. I had a colleague who got hired by Caltech, and, oh, this is being recorded. I got a colleague who's hired by a, a, a great university in Pasadena, and, <laughs> And the reason he was hired was in comparison to a small, uh, great engineering university in Claremont, uh, the alumni of the one in Pasadena, the alumni board said the one thing they regretted was they weren't taught any team skills. <laughs> and that at that university, you could just show up and take the test. 
not go to class. Yeah. And they did, and did well. They got hired, they didn't show up, <laughs> and, and they got fired. And they said, what's up with that? I never had to go to anything in my life. And so, uh, and so they reintroduced uh, team skills, uh, team leadership as a key part uh, even within a technical uh, entity is, is, is really critical. You know, at, at Google, you can't get promoted without peer references. That's how fundamental they view teamwork uh, to the success of the business. All right, let's come back to it, to the guessing game, P. It's gonna be a tough one. Huh? Huh? Persuasive. Now, Honestly, written communication was important in the 20th century, uh, and some could say it seems less important these days. But written communication is still important. Uh, verbal communication is important. Visual communication is important. Per and all of those have to be persuasive. Uh, in fact, when you think about story maps, part of what sport story maps, for those of you familiar with them, do is tell a story to be persuasive. You can have a lot of facts, but if you don't have context for it, if you don't have an argument with it, it's not convincing. <laughs> I'm running out of gas here. There's the other E, environmental. Again, you know, some may say environmental uh, it doesn't have to be for everybody, but for us at the University of Redlands, it certainly is. I'll let you give one last chance to the S1. It relates to environmental. It's not, it's not just the business, but it's the business in... Society, that's right. So these are the 10 critical skills that we're focusing on in our strategic plan. What courses do we have that will teach these skills? What assessments will we have? What opportunities will we have for students to demonstrate those skills? That's a key part of our mission uh, at the school. Now I'd also note, when you think about GIS, a lot of these things are inherent in GIS and spatial. It's integrative, it brings together a lot of different data, right, to understand. It certainly is analytical in a variety of different ways. It's analytical, it certainly is digital, it certainly is spatial, it certainly is global. There's certainly a value about the ethical use of information and maps and, and how, how to not you know, lie with, with maps like you could lie with statistics, right? It is collaborative by its nature and certainly that's been one of the growth area. Story maps and other elements of, of GIS aim to be persuasive, to make a case, to demonstrate something. Environmental E, S-R-I, uh, as, as a key feature of GIS and of ESRI. And certainly the, 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 the broad swath of endeavors of GIS, it cuts across all elements of society. So I would say that the School of Business and GIS and ESRI are at one in thinking about these kinds of critical skills and how to have education, technology, and programs that help deliver those skills to students and professionals. As a passing note, and I won't read each of these little pieces, uh, it does correlate well with what's viewed as the GIS competency model that's out there in the field. It's not only understanding the technology, but your own personal skills, team skills, leadership skills, that's the general point uh, that I'm making, and it really is a key point of our school of business as we start thinking about uh, spatial analytics. So let me turn now to GIS and business. It's been said that 80%, some say it's been said, others say it's been estimate, estimated. <laughs> and uh, when you go to the paper, uh, uh, it, it, it's a close estimation. Uh, but some 80% of business data can be georeferenced. Well, when you think about it, every business has a customer. Every customer lives somewhere, right? Just, just by that alone, there's a lot of sp spatial information. We've been studying, and the field has been studying, and ESRI has been studying uh, documented gains, both on the revenue side, by using spatial information about customers. Where do they live? What do they want? How do we put a place there? as well as operational and infrastructure savings. How do we consolidate stores? How do we do a better job at servicing? And those kinds of things. We've been doing, and others, and ESRI, have been doing these case studies to try and document some of these uh, cases in business. Because in some ways, when you think about it, a GIS came out of a governmental environment, 
land use, urban planning, transportation, uh, so on. So understanding it within the governmental sphere has been looked at for a long time. Understanding its use within businesses and organizations and operations is relatively new, and for us that means a, good, a great opportunity to contribute. So that's why I say here, yet as an industry, we're just beginning to understand and capitalize on spatial an analytics and the workflows that are tied to these things. Uh, we had a session once with some colleagues at ESRI. We're trying to think it through. How do you describe it? One way to think about it is, what's the mission of an organization? How important is spatial information to achieving that mission of the organization? Is it being measured? Is it being valued? It could be a store. How many different stores do you have? It could be a nonprofit. How many different churches do you have? Right? How do you know what's going on with those spatial uh, dimensions, and how do you understand it and tie it to objectives? These are some of the industries that have been looked at, and, uh, and that certainly I've looked at, and others, to try and develop this knowledge base for it. Just last year, uh, Harvard Business Review came out with this article just to show that the future, <laughs> uh, I looked east, what did you say? I saw the light, and the, there's that old song, and the future was bright, right? And so uh, that I had to wear shades, it was so bright. And so why? Because there's even more opportunity in using JS for business looking forward. So these, uh, these graphs here show the uh, value of loc the percent of companies that use locational information now and expect to in two years. So 40% of those surveyed use it now, 73% expect to use it in, three, in two years. Saying, uh, this is compared to text information, social media, click, uh, machine-generated video. So within the big data world, locational information is critical. This breaks it down by industry right here, energy, transportation, financial services, telecom, healthcare, so on and so forth. Uh, they don't have their colors right. One way to look at it is this means extremely important, this means very important, this means somewhat important, important. and down here the gray means I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's kind of like 80% think they're important and the other ones didn't fill out the survey. No, but uh, uh, you can see here that for each of the industries, the broad swath I think is either extremely or very important to have locational information. So the challenge is, how do you develop a workforce, not only at the entry level, but at the, uh, you know, at the experience level, in order to use that information? And I'll get to our educational uh, component in a second, but I wanted to take a moment to just talk a bit about how research informs this and, and some of my experience in doing it. You know, ever since I got those keys in 1990 for the GIS, uh, myself and my colleagues, students have done a ton of studies. Uh, using GIS. So I, I, I picked one uh, just uh, as an example, and also Esri helped with the video, and it's a great video. And so we got involved in what was called a freight economy project. Uh, the railroads, particularly BNSF, uh, had a concern that while they were very vital to their customers in moving uh, various products across the country, nobody understood what freight does railroads. They, they just get in the way. You just have to stop your car and wait for them. And so they wanted to have a study that helped illuminate, persuade, if you will, the relationship of the freight economy to the economy of the United States and, and so on. And it asked us to kind of zero in uh, on Minnesota, but look at its role throughout, throughout, the, throughout the United States. And we ended up doing a report on it uh, that showed the interrelationship between uh, growing economies and freight rail and the spatial elements of that. And the, su the surprise in this was that in the Minnesota and in elsewhere, it was not the downtown economies that were pulling the state and many states out of the recession. It was the old-fashioned industries that came back first. And we were able to show that uh, in our analysis, and it helped spur further economic development. Uh, when we were done, a uh, video was made of the project, and I thought I'd show you the video, because I think it highlights uh, some of the aspects that I've been uh, talking about. The role of transportation uh, has not diminished in the contemporary economy. It's changed, and it's as important as ever. 
The story of highways is pretty well known, the importance to communities. The story about buses and passenger rail is pretty well known. There isn't an understood story about freight rail in common conversation. And common conversation is important. It's about how the public understands. It's about how policymakers understand. So we undertook this study to help explain the kind of economic impact that freight rail has within communities, within the state of Minnesota, and by inference within the Midwest. The key to unlocking that understanding was maps and being able to see around different communities which industries were using freight rail a lot and the economic impact of that and where their products and goods went. So that's really what motivated us to do the study and compelled us to use GIS and maps. When we use GIS to analyze industry clusters, we're able to see several of these clusters which were growing at a very fast rate throughout the state, many of which are in rural environments, mining in the northeast, certainly farming throughout the rural parts of Minnesota, iron ore, turkey, soybeans, heavy machinery, and I think that's what GIS can do. It can take a complicated story about how turkeys that are raised in southern Minnesota get processed and moved and transported and shipped and can tell it in maps so that anybody can see the importance of those economic clusters and the importance of freight rail to the communities and the jobs they have. People who see our trains are sometimes unaware of the countless goods and commodities that we're moving from their communities to cities such as Chicago and Kansas City or to intermodal ports like Los Angeles and Houston. BNSF Railway is the engine that connects local economies to urban and foreign markets. The university's report and especially their interactive maps provide vivid examples of the synergy between local economies and the freight infrastructure that connects these economies to national and increasingly international markets. Just in the last year, exports from Minnesota to China have grown by about 35 percent and our rail and intermodal systems have helped enable Minnesota businesses to move their goods and products to these growing markets. You will see the clustering of the key industries that have driven the state's economies to grow at a rate above the national average. The maps illustrate the export of commodities such as soybeans through expanded port facilities that BNSF serves in the Pacific Northwest. The study may focus on Minnesota, but the lessons apply across the United States. The basic findings of the study are that freight rail is a key part of the economy and should be addressed in, in both the public and private sector uh, as an economic development kind of component. And so that's just a new framing for freight rail. Another finding pertains to the intermodalism and the importance of the public and private sector to cooperate to develop an intermodal uh, capacity. Finally, you know, an area of the study that we spent a lot of time on was the importance of public outreach and, and creating dialogue with the public sector in order to allow for win-win solutions. Our goal is not to produce GIS maps for map's sake, but to produce a visual analysis and spatial analysis that can make a difference. We think that it can be used in crafting you know, a new understanding and a new set of policies the University of Minnesota Freight Rail Study underscores the importance of the region's transportation economy and it tells a story that we see play out every day as we move freight from local communities to the marketplace. Okay, I, I tell you, when you can get an endorsement by the executive chairman of BNSF, it's a good day. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we're really pleased with that. Uh, we helped integrate information about economic growth from different sectors where, the, where it was occurring. We helped educate the public on the economic value to the communities. We helped educate BNSF about where there were uh, bottlenecks and, and real price problems with moving things and creating new, new solutions. Uh, since, since this study, we've gone on to a more national study with national participants to look at to develop, and we're midway through it, a national freight economy atlas, which looks at different sectors. You saw those different verticals, and how can GIS and, and industry clusters help those industries? One we're taking on right now, for example, is, is uh, medical devices. If, if, uh, if, if a grain is to railroads, or grain is to BNSF, 
as medical devices is to FedEx, <laughs> right? Because because uh, freight uh, rail moves big things that don't cost a lot per ounce. Air moves things that cost a lot per ounce and have to be there right away. Pacemakers, uh, you know, etc. Et and we've been working with Medtronic to understand global chains for uh, pacemakers and how to use GIS uh, in that regard. So it shows that through each segment of the economy, there's a way to think about the business of that economy, but also how it plays out in the community uh, as, as well as globally. Now, that's research and research I've been engaged in. What attracts me very much about the University of Redlands, what attracted me, uh, was the notion of a spatial university. I could do it myself with eight people for the rest of my life, but to be able to work within a context where it's a university value, where it's a university program, is a great opportunity to, get, to take this liberal arts, interdisciplinary, business-minded approach to GIS. And so, uh, and so joining a spatial university is, is just a great thing. Uh, Steve Moore recently uh, right, posted a, a new landing page that goes over the various programs at the University of Redlands, and you've probably heard some about them in terms of the Master's in GIS, the Spatial Studies, and, and today I'm really kind of focusing in on the business aspect of it. We have a Center for Business GIS and Spatial Analysis, which for the last decade has been doing research, writing books, uh, sponsoring conferences. So right in your backyard, uh, uh, there's a group that's been trolling on it for a decade and really places the University of Redlands and the business school at the forefront of this emerging area of business and GIS. One way that we do that is to have a GIS emphasis in the MBA. So rather than focus strictly on the technical aspects of GIS, which are important to know at least some of, it focuses on the applications of GIS, how to manage uh, uh, be in a management role for GIS, how to use it for marketing, how to use it for international, for global sourcing, how to do strategy uh, and incorporate GIS. So these are all the elements that get incorporated into the master's, the MBA with a GIS emphasis. Now we've looked at who's graduated and we found that about half the students go into quote unquote a GIS related uh, specialty and the other half go into management, which is exactly what we want. We want not only the producers of information, but the consumers, the decision makers, to be uh, educated about, about GIS. What it says here at the bottom is, there remains important opportunities to train within the context of business settings, not the analyst, uh, not the first line manager, but up through the senior executives. When I did work for Salesforce, which is another big company, their, their big gap was not the administrators, but getting that information to be used to make decisions, particularly strategic decisions. Same for GIS, and how do you create an understanding of how that's done in sales, in marketing, in support, in customer relations, in locations, in tying uh, supply chains into uh, uh, logistics and so forth. And how, you, how do you build a business plan for that is something that we're very keenly uh, interested in. So, so where are we headed? You know, I've been on, uh, <laughs> I've been on the job four months and I'm exhausted because <laughs> uh, we've been doing a lot, but, uh, but that's just the way I run, I guess. And so we've been racing through this strategic plan and just want to tell you a few elements about it. First is we have an online MBA and we want, we're going to put this GIS for Business online as an emphasis, which would be the first MBA we think in the globe, it's a big statement, uh, somebody might come out there and ping me on that, but we've been checking uh, to have an, an online MBA with a GIS for business emphasis, which would be a very big differentiator for us as a school. We're working with our Masters of Science Information Technology in the GIS components. There's obviously the MS in GIS that we've begun discussion with. Pr probably the biggest new aspect is how to create pathways throughout the liberal arts into GIS so that you can have that management as a liberal arts perspective that I was talking about at, at the beginning. A second major area is education, how to develop Harvard Business School like case studies that can help promote it out there in, in the educational world, 
how to do research on business processes that's kind of in the weeds, but it's where things can break down. Uh, how to look the, at the business societal linkages and use GIS for corporate social responsibility, sustainability, and those kinds of things. And then finally, how to turn this into a training opportunity, not just for students, traditional students, but for management, for leadership, how to de deliver online certificates, which we're going to start, and how to participate in cer certification processes. So these are all areas that we're moving in and really quite excited about what they may hold. So let me kind of end where I started, which is this idea of management as a liberal art and the idea of the school of business as be having those key elements, but fundamentally a management as a liberal arts school. Some say that that's kind of passe, but the data suggests that that's not the case. Uh, in 2014, this article was published by the uh, Harvard Business Review, and it remains true today. And, and it was about the renaissance that was needed in business education. The business education had become too boring, really, you know, marketing, finance, et cetera. And not really having these integrative, analytical, persuasive skills that are needed in the workplace. And so what this article uh, uh, said was, the business leaders who will succeed in the coming decade will be notable for their holistic thinking, global perspectives, international experience, multilingual capabilities, technological familiarity, entrepreneurial mindset, uh, creativity, and the ability to deal producti productively with complexity and chaos. I like that last phrase. A lot of my life has been <laughs> productively good. And so, but th this is what is going to be needed based on uh, the interviews and the data that they have. Uh, so what they say is many corporations have already said that they cannot find the type of employees they need. So we must begin acting now to transform our business schools. It is our job as educators to produce graduates who can thrive in a radically changing world and who can shape in positive ways. We must educate a new generation of Renaissance leaders. And it's on that that I hang my hat and conclude. Thank you very much. Thanks. There's well, my electronic card. Yeah, I, I must congratulate Tom because I said, you know, he said, I'm only speaking for 30 minutes. I said, you know, that's what they all say, but he actually did it. So we have plenty of time for um, questions. Anybody have any, any questions for Tom? We've got a couple of um, very um, adept students that will uh, run the mics. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and um, wait till they get it to you so that we can all um, we can all hear the question. There, we've got one right there. Hi, Tom, I have a question for you. I'm over here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's quite all right. Um, so I'm a recent graduate of the MBA program. And um, I, I'm glad that you're starting an online program. But my concern is, and I, I work in a um, big department, I manage a $15 million budget and about 200 employees. And my concern about online degrees, because I'm hiring people with online degrees, is that they don't have a lot of those skills that you listed as that 21st century leader, especially the collaborative part. Um, and part of what was so special about the MBA program at University of Redlands was the cohort that I sat with for two years, and I'm sitting next to one that I met in orientation, who's now one of my best friends. And, and not, I can't, online. I can't not, not online. Not online. And not online. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering how you're going to, to right. connect that with the online degree. So uh, let me first say that we have not positioned the online MBA to be this huge replacement for the seven campus on the ground experience. The vast majority and the cornerstone of what we do is on the ground. It's positioned for those for whom that was not possible. Uh, you know, and it's interesting, the, some of the first people who enrolled, you might say, oh, they were probably from Iowa or someplace far away. Not true. They knew the Redlands brand. But, but it was you know, a, working, a, a working mother that just couldn't get that one day a week. So see it more as people who otherwise could not get it rather than replacing. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's one part of the answer. You know, the, the second part is, 
I may get, be getting a little of my skis here. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if inevitably we end up in a hybrid world uh, where both are available to some extent depending on a variety of circumstances. So uh, I was looking at, we're start, starting a new master's in leadership and management, for example, and, uh, and we'll start it on the ground, but a lot of the programs have a combination where some of it's online and so that you can get that you know, interpersonal team cohort thing because that's a critical part. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm agreeing with you and saying this is more for someone who otherwise wouldn't, but we're not gonna give up on the, uh, the, the fundamental value of actually interacting with people. <laughs> All right. okay. uh, there's, there's a couple of questions, questions I saw kind of. Thank you. In your BNSF study of right. freight transport, did you study uh, the future of coal transport? Because I think BNSF hauls a lot of coal, and it doesn't seem like coal has a bright future. Yeah, well, <laughs> oil is even a bigger problem, actually. But uh, uh, we did. We looked at the, you know, it was, it was interesting. Uh, if you could rewind the clock. Uh, when we did our first preliminary results, we had a conference, and everybody was there. Matt Rose, Senator Klobuchar, the governor was going to be there, but the chief of staff came. And the storyline was, look at these industry clusters that have grown to give Minnesota one of the highest uh, state uh, domestic product, products of any, of any state per capita. It was a good news story. If we'd done predictive analytics, this was fall of 2013, and you may not remember, by winter, of 2013-14, demand for oil had gone up so much because of Canada, you know, and the fracking, right? Demand for grain had gone up so much because of China's uh, appetite, and demand for various uh, goods as the United States was pulling out like cars, as the United States was coming out of recession, you put all those things, to, three things together, and then you have a super snowstorm winter. And the whole, it's shut down. And BNSF ended up being hauled before the transportation board, fined for, because cars couldn't come to the Midwest because, you know, and a lot of recommendations came out of that. Back to your, your, to your point, uh, I think that uh, the movement of energy uh, is a major part of what happens on the transportation system. Uh, the bigger problem, really, they've really reduced, they've reduced their uh, movement of coal and have switched over to movement of oil. And, and that's where I think throughout the Midwest there's, there's more concern because one of those things blows up and you've got this huge, you've got this huge problem. So it is, and, 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 and by, by spring 14, the governor was asking us to come meet with the staff not to share the good news story about the growth of these industry clusters, but to talk about uh, what kind of policy should be in place to ensure the adequate supply of, uh, of, of rail. Because, you know, in trucks, you can get other trucks, right? And rail is one line. And so it really had an impact on public policy. So energy, energy is an important thing that's moved. Others? Make it up to the top there, Jordan. I'd like to speak to the online versus the on, uh, on the ground. Right. Why couldn't some of these students find, surely find some time to come over here and spend two weeks, three weeks, or whatever, and uh, uh, brainwash them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we call that educate them. No. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, when I went, since I've joined, I've gone. Well, let me talk about the different campuses, then I'll talk online. I've been around to the different campuses, and I don't know if anybody's here. Is anybody here been a graduate of one of these camp, regional campuses? Just one of them. Uh, they're their own ecosystem, and that's great. They meet their cohorts, they have employers right around them. 
but we want them to come to the motherland on occasion, to come to Redlands, and we think it helps build affinity. And so moving forward, we're going to start having more events that, uh, that come close to requiring spending some time in Redlands, some time you know, interacting with the core faculty there in order to build that affinity that, that will go on um, you know, throughout. Uh, as regards to the, uh, to the online, uh, as I said, uh, we've only launched it this fall. I mean, we're talking right now about you know, 25 people versus 1,700. You know? So, so I, I haven't been losing sleep on the, uh, I'm gonna sleep, maybe get a few more, but, uh, but I, I would agree with what I think is a thrust of your comment, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is we want people to come have some experience at, at Redlands. And, and we have to create opportunities for that, including with our 28,000 alumni as an opportunity uh, to come and network and, and things like that. So we really do want to build in that, that face-to-face. One of Others? Them. Yes. Yeah, one. Uh, William Hall from Hemet. And you use the term GIS abundantly. Can oh. you explain that terminology a little more for yeah, us? Yeah, I would be. I, and how it integrates. Yeah, I, I'd be seriously fined. Uh, we have a thing at the university, you know, a you know, dollar for every acronym you say. I'd be in serious trouble. Uh, so saying it, uh, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Uh, it basically is taking data of various kind and not only rendering it on a map, hence the geographic information system, uh, but analyzing it and being able to produce results that can inform governments, businesses, et cetera, on how these geographical differences and, and this geographical information uh, affects their business or, or shows that this region's not doing well, this one's doing better, Anything that you can think about on a map is what we will call for, uh, for right now GIS. It, it just so happens that the largest provider of that technology is in this building. The largest provider in the world uh, is in this building. And, uh, and it's really a testament to the Dangermans who founded the company, a testament to Redlands uh, that it's located here and to the people who, who work here. So that's, I apologize for the shorthand, but I hope that explains it uh, a bit. Take one more question if we've got one. No? All right, thank you okay. again very much, Dr. Thanks. Hare.